Uh, crab is the intermediate host, so how we human get it? By eating raw crab or crayfish, raw crab, crayfish meat. Here is the life cycle. So what happens, we human, either by, you see the chart, either by sputum or by feces. You guys see that? By sputum or feces, the eggs get out, and then the eggs go find a uh, snail, and from snail, the cercaria go find a crayfish, and we eat the crayfish or uh, crab, and then we become infected. Of course, we don't cook it. If we cook it, we kill the, uh, uh, the crustaceans, the metacercaria right here. Okay, I hope that you get yourself familiarized with these pictures from CDC, Central Disease Control. Here yeah, is people, I got these pictures, they will go on the, uh, here is a body of water in the background and they are collecting crayfish right here and then of course they might go ahead and crack some of them and eat them. And when they have to poop, where do you think they go poop? Right here. So the life cycle keeps going and going and going. Over. If they have sputum, right, where do they swallow it or not? They have it right there. Okay. So, and also children, they go play around near body of water and they grab crayfish and eat it. And if they have to poop, they poop right here. Or they have a sputum, they put out the sputum right here. And then, of course that body of water has the crayfish, they're eating it raw. And then of course that body of water has the snail. So all of that, all of those factors are in one place and the life cycle keeps going and going. Yes? They get into what? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. Nobody knows. It, seem, it seems like it, they complete their life cycle in the snail and from snail they go to some other animal and from that animal they go to a human. And that's why I mentioned that I'm not I'm evading your question because really nobody knows. Uh, and at the beginning I said one egg becomes many larvae, right? So they have to go through snail, they have to go through uh, crayfish, and then they have to go through human in order for the life cycle to be complete. Um, very unusual in animal kingdom that you have one egg becomes many larvae. The rest of animal kingdom, the cockroach, ant, Whatever animal, we always say, God, too many flies here. One egg becomes one fly. One egg becomes one cockroach. One egg becomes one ant. You guys see ant cockroaches in the world, but not in this case. That's the best answer I have for it. They have to go through so much. So yes? We could end, like, all of these, we could end the life cycle and just go into an outhouse or like, Perfect. Out. Yeah. Just go to an outhouse. What else we can do to get rid of this life cycle? Anybody? I said, what is the biological means? I'm going back far, 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 far. Here we go. What method of biological control can you think of? Cooking food. No, biological control. Biological control. Oh, very good. How, how can I get rid of the stem? How? Poison water. Well, that would be chemical. Get rid of it. Huh? How? There are some biological methods. I don't know. Do you guys go? Uh, have you guys gone to Home Depot and they say ladybugs in the back? Yeah. Have you seen them? Mm -hmm. Why? Why Home Depot is selling ladybugs in the back? Yes. So you put them on your plants, so they eat the bad ones. Like they the eat aphids. the aphids. You put the ladybugs, so you don't spray your plants with chemicals. The ladybugs eat the aphids. That's called biological control. They eat the parasites, they eat the bugs of the plants, the ladybugs. So here, to control this, you can use a crayfish or some other animal, introduce it to the body of water to kill the snail, to eat the snail. If that happens, then biologically, you control the parasite. You cannot, it is tough to train people to go to the outhouse, 
we talked about this. Uh, tell them, hey, we have outhouses that do not defecate, they like to defecate in water so they can wash themselves with water and so on and so forth, whatever it is. If those does not work and you don't want to spray the water with chemicals, we suggest that with a nuclear bomb or something. <laughs> right, that's a chemical. So what, that's, isn't that what you suggest that they, but uh, you can introduce what I meant as some kind of crayfish to eat it in snail. When they eat the snail, of course, this, this crayfish, in this case, are not eating those snails. But I'm saying in lobster, snail, something. So they will eat them, and then you're controlling the death. Just the analogy I gave you. We do not have one yet that is working. The analogy I gave you, ladybug and the aphids. The ladybug eats the aphids on the plants at home. Anyway, if you have not seen it, you know, in the springtime, go to the home people. They have ladybugs. Yes, sir. OK, so we talked about all of these. Um, subclass monogenea, we do not have it in the lab. Uh, all parasitics on gills uh, or external surface of the fishes. Uh, ectoparasitism cause infestation. Already talked about that. So these guys cause infestation of fishes. Are you ready? Huh? Are, you, are you ready? Yeah. You want to? Okay. okay. In about 10 minutes. Let's do it. Uh, and then ectoparasites cause infestation and direct life cycle, single host, they do not have uh, any snail, any, I don't know, crayfish, anything like that. So they are transmitted from fish to fish to fish to fish. Okay? And uh, what happens? Egg has single larva, uh, the larva becomes uh, oncomericidium. And oncomericidium attaches to the gills of fish and suck blood until they become adult. Then they detach from the fish and then they carry on the life cycle by releasing eggs and the eggs become larvae in the body of water and so on and so forth. Uh, Opisothapter is the name of the structure I'll show you guys in a minute that they cling on to the fish and uh, of course they suck blood. And uh, one organism I gave you the uh, name of it, uh, Gyrodactylus cylindriformis. That's the name of the organism I gave you. Again, we do not have any of these in the lab, but it could be a problem in a fish pond or a fish lake you have in a, uh, back, your backyard. It could be a problem, and they suck blood, and eventually they can, in heavy infestation, heavy infestation, they can kill fishes. But if one attaches the gills of the fish and they suck blood, and not much happens and the fish survives. The next class is class Cestoda. These are tapeworms. Common name for this class is tapeworms. Class Cestoda. And then um, and tapeworms, all members of this class are parasitic. And the three major parts, scolex, uh, which are suckers, hooks, and for attachment, neck area, and strobular chain of proglottis. So if you would, right here, so you have scolex, and we'll talk about, we'll talk about different type of scolex. This is called scolex. Right here is called scolex. As you can see, they're a little bit different. Okay? And they have suckers. This is sucker, 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 sucker. Okay, and these are called hooks. Okay? So, and then that's the first part, neck area. This is the neck area where asexual reproduction of these parasites occur. This is the neck area. And then uh, the strobula toward the end of the animal. So imagine this is the animal. Uh, this is the scolix right here. And these are the neck area toward the end of the animal, mid to the end of the animal. Then you have the strobula. The strobula is which we call it proglottis. So this is a proglottis. This is a proglottis. This is a proglottis. And I have a name for each one of them. Okay, this is immature proglottis. This is a mature proglottis. And this is a ripe, ripe proglottis or gravid. They call it gravid uh, or ripe proglottis. So same as this one. Of course, this one does not have the scrolex, but the proglottids, this is a mature proglottids, and this is a ripe proglottids. Mature, ripe. And that's all I have on this model. 
that model has immature at the neck region and all of the groups. Okay, so those are the three main parts of the tapeworms. Um, they do not have a digestive system, digestive tract, if you will. These animals do not have a system. So they do not have, how do they absorb the food? How do you think they absorb the food? Yeah, directly through the tegument, right here. Where did I do with the other? So when they are in our intestine, when the adult worm is intestine, food is absorbed through the tegument, right here. Food gets in. Okay, so they do not have a digestive system. What else? Uh, nearly all monaceous. Trematodes. Can I make a statement like this? All trematodes are monaceous. No. I just talked about it. Schistosoma is not monaceous. All of schistosoma. The dioecious. Right? Yes? Am I making some sense? Natalie? Okay. Come. Uh, tapeworms gross anatomy gross it means big picture uh, you, take, you guys take gross anatomy later on in your life when you go to medical school uh, scolex or hold fast another name for scolex is hold fast they call this hold fast or scolex so whatever you write me down doing the exam I'll take, I'll take it so scolex or hold fast contain rostellum okay rostellum is the elevation of the scolex, like this one. You see the elevation right here? That is rostellum. That elevation, not the hooks. This one does not have any rostellum. Some tapeworms have rostellum, some tapeworms don't. So this one doesn't, this one does. Okay, um, a germinative zone is the neck area. Another name for the neck area is called germinative zone. That's where the animal gets elongated. It becomes longer and longer and longer right here. Asexual reproduction occurs right here, germinative zone. And then adults invertebrate, usually intermediate hosts, if they exist, are in invertebrates most of the time. Cross fertilization is possible. What happens, the reason I put that in there, because most of the time, you have, most of the time, you have one host, one tapeworm. One host, one tapeworm. So, if there are two in the intestine, mostly found in the intestine, then they do practice cross-fertilization. And you all know what cross-fertilization is. Sperm transferred to the tapeworm here. Usually, do not harm their host. And that's one reason they're successful. All species on planet Earth, they have a tapeworm. And these guys are not harming them. The tapeworms are not harming their host. But the ones I mentioned in this class, they are the ones that they do harm us. They are not, we are not the normal host for them, but they do harm us. The ones that I mentioned in this class, uh, they are most common type of um, tapeworms and compost, and I will talk about that. Hang on. Here it is, general characteristics. Let's look at the picture. A picture in biology says more than a million words. Here is the scolex right here, and the scolex is being enlarged right here. This is, what do you guys think this is? What do you guys think this is from the beginning of the semester? Microvilli? Uh, no. Villus. These are your villus, right? Right? These are your villus. And then they attach the small intestine with their suckers. The scolex right here, they have suckers. And or, or some of them have hooks. They attach. And here is a germinative zone, asexual reproduction. And the animal becomes longer and longer and longer. And mid-animal, midway through, then you have mature proglottids. And toward the end of the animal, toward the end, you have ripe proglottids. And what happens, these animals, the right proglottids get out with the feces of the host. So they are in the intestine, right? And they become long and long and long and long, not all of them. Some of them can become nine meters long in the intestine of human. 
and they compete with our food. Food is being absorbed right here through the tegument, right? Do that make sense? Through the tegument. And then toward the end, when the entire prokaryotic becomes full of eggs, then they get out. The ripe pro prokaryotic, the ripe prokaryotic get out in the feces. Or in some cases, if ruptures open, the eggs get out in the feces. It depends on the tapeworm. Some tapeworms you will see in the lab, you have the ripe prokaryotic in the dogs, in case of dog tapeworm. You have the ripe prokaryotic look like uh, rice grains on the tail of the dog. It's not. Dogs don't eat rice. Okay, so uh, in the mature prokaryotic and the slides in the lab, you should be able to observe testes, uh, uterus, um, genital cord, do not worry about vagina. Um, I said uterus, um, the, uh, they call it shell glands, uh, but do not worry about that. And then you have yolk glands or betaline glands. And of course the ovaries, two ovaries. That's it, pretty much those are most of the things I would like you to find out. Oh, the testes, did I mention testes? So, on the mature prokaryotes, if you would, right here, you have the two ovaries. These, all of the blue is testes. The gray is uterus, yolk glands, right here. And these are excretory canals, nerve cord, muscles, of course, genital cord. And this is your ripe proglottis. It means toward the end of the animal, toward the posterior end of the animal, the uterus, see, remember, uterus is right here. The uterus is full of eggs. That's what happens for the posterior end of the animal. Okay, so I talked about everything that I need to talk about. The first organism is Tinea saginatus. It's a human tape or warm beef tape one, they call it. It does not harm us at all. I mean, some people like, somebody in the lab mentioned it, some people uh, like to take it in order to lose weight. I would not do that. It's not wise thing to do. Okay, I asked Maria, you guys, to come up here and give us uh, a presentation on how to get summer internship. Those of you who want to go to medical school, pharmacy school, dental school, it is important that you have a, at least one nice summer internship. And she's going to give you all of the nuts and bolts. I like that term, nuts and bolts. It's my, my word, nuts and bolts. Uh, nuts and bolts of how to get summer internship. All right? Thank you, Mario. Come on up and tell us. I want to learn too because what I am learning from you, I want to 